Hey guys, this is Val again. Welcome back to Leagues. Uh, today we have a much awaited talk, uh, our, global, our first global surgery partnerships. And we have two special guests with us today, um, Dr. Abahuji uh, and Dr. Scott, uh, who are joining us in the middle of their work and we're very appreciative of their time. Uh, Dr. Jida Bahuji is a general surgeon and a lecturer uh, of surgery at the University of Rwanda. He completed his general surgery training at the University of Rwanda in 2016, and thereafter he completed a research fellowship in simulation and medical education at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, that little known institution. Uh, and then, because that wasn't enough, he completed a master's degree in health professions education at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Dr. Abahuji's research focuses on non-technical skills for surgeons, NOTs, uh, patient safety, and global surgery. And he's interested in exploring effective strategies um, for training care teams in low and middle income countries. And Dr. Scott, who is my faculty member, um, is uh, an assistant professor of surgery, of surgery here at the University of Michigan. He started about a year ago, Dr. Scott. Plus almost, minus. Almost. Um, he received his BA degree in biological sciences uh, from Harvard. Uh, he got his uh, medical degree from Vanderbilt and then completed his general surgery training at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston uh, in his fellowship in trauma and surgical critical care uh, at the Harvard View Medical Center in Seattle prior to joining mm -hmm. us for his first attending position. Uh, Dr. Scott uh, is a health services researcher and he's also interested in access to care. And he spent two years during his general surgery training uh, doing a global surgery work. So today the both of them are going to uh, tell us a little bit about their journey um, and uh, how did they develop their partnerships and all of the highlights of their work together. Doctors, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for the chance to be here. Is, is my audio working? Is everybody, can y'all hear me all right? Um, I'm just excited to see Ajit. It's been a little while, and so uh, this is a fun excuse to, to get together. Um, let me see if I can start sharing my slides. So what we had talked about doing, and Ajit, correct me if we need to change plans, but I'm going to sort of, what's cool, Ajit and I didn't work together exactly a lot, and we sort of, I did a little bit, and then he's like made it worldwide, and so that's, you'll, you'll know he's far more impressive than I am, but I'm going to tell you my sort of view my lens and sort of my first start to the story and then I'll stop and then Ajit will pick up where I leave off and then uh, we'd like to have some time at the end to to talk through some questions and um, kind of give you our perspective. Uh, let me get the screen share going and I don't exactly know what happens when I go to presenter mode that's not the right slide, but now you know a lot of people showed up at one point. <laughs> uh, but I don't see your notes if you have any notes. I just see the slides, so you're good That's to go. Good. I don't. I don't have notes. That that takes you know a lot of a lot of organization there. Um, so this is just sort of my okay. Y'all y'all got a title slide? Is that working? Yep. Okay, you're great. good to go. All right. Great. So. You know, my disclaimer is that this is meant to be a story about academic partnerships and global surgery, but really this is a personal story. This is just my story. This is not the, the right way to do it. This is not the only way to do it. This is not the, the better way to do it. It's just a way to do it, and it's the way that I sort of went through this process. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that I can share with you sort of those types of insights, um, I want to be clear that this is just me. I don't anybody I work for past or present. Um, I don't represent the voice of all my partners, but um, you know, this work is literally like hundreds of people uh, it has taken to do this work. And there's a lot of people who are leaders in this work. Um, I was just sort of one phase of it, and I'm gonna tell you about that. Now, in case we run out of time, I like to go just first. And so that, that's what we got. Uh, this, is, this is the end slide at the beginning here. And what you're gonna hear from me is that uh, to do good work, it's gonna take a team. Uh, and so this is specifically through the lens of research partnerships, not clinical partnerships. Uh, obviously that takes a team too, but every, all the lens I'm gonna give you is about research. And you know, a lot of folks talk about, I mentioned global surgery, but uh, you know, 
is you, you know, what, what is what we call global surgery when I'm operating in Rwanda and Rwanda is just called surgery. Uh, and, and I think that we sometimes do ourselves a disservice making global surgery so other. Uh, the whole point of this work is about like understanding the unique context, but it's not other. It's just, it's just the good work you should do in Detroit, that you should do in Ann Arbor, that you should do in Boston, and you should do in Kigali. Um, and context matters a lot wherever you are, and methods matter wherever you are. And it doesn't matter where you're at, you should be working at this, the state of the science, like pushing yourself to not say, well, this is good enough because, you know, it's South Carolina and, and that's all we can do. I'm from South Carolina, I can say things like that. Uh, but rather saying, okay, we have a data problem. We don't have enough data. So how do you deal with missing data? There's a way to deal with it. And what's the state of the science? How can we push the envelope? And I really try to do great work. Um, and then it, it starts and ends with partnerships. Uh, I don't really know that I'll ever be culturally competent anywhere, uh, uh, the U.S. included, but hopefully I can, I can uh, develop some cultural humility, and, and that's something we should all sort of strive to. Uh, so, so that's it. That's the talk. But I'm going to buzz through sort of my experience. When we talk about what makes a good surgeon, you hear a lot of things. There's a lot of things about how you handle your tissues and how you make decisions and are you a good leader and, and how you plan ahead. And, and really, you can sort of uh, cluster them into, you know, technical things and non-technical things. And it's not that, you know, being a good leader matters more than being good at suturing. You have to have both, but you can't be just good at throwing your knots. You have to be excellent at both technical skills and non-technical skills. And we know this because so much of error that happens in the operating room, it's problems of perception, it's problems of communication, it's problem of sort of situation awareness. When you cut the bile duct, you didn't say, oh, I meant to cut here and I cut there. It's, you thought it was the cystic duct and it was the bile duct. And so that's not a technical problem, that's a cognition problem. That's a different type of skill. And so we know that non-technical skills are really important because when you try to get better outcomes and try to look at what your outcomes are gonna be, you know that the inputs, some people are focused on improving the patient inputs and, and, and uh, you know, the type of procedure and things like that. The surgeons, this is where we're going to focus. We have technical skill, we have cognitive skill, we have social skill. We spend a lot of time teaching technical skills. We spend very little time teaching cognitive skills and social skills for the operating room. But with that, you reduce your chance of an error, and then you have better outcomes. So if non-technical skills are so important, then how do we like put them into words? How do we teach it? How do we discuss it? How do we get better at it? And uh, up, until uh, up until about my third year residency, I had never heard of non-technical skills or how to get better at them. So there's this uh, curriculum that was developed back in the early 2000s by a guy named Steve Yule and his partners uh, out of Scotland. And uh, they developed a training curriculum for non-technical skills for surgeons. And they defined non-technical skills as the behavioral things that you know underpin excellent performance and their cognitive skills, situation awareness, decision-making, their social skills, communication, teamwork, leadership. And that's good because the operating room is a pretty complex place. Uh, you know, this is just the view from the anesthesiologist and there's a lot going on there. And so if you're not anticipating, if you're not communicating, there's a whole lot of ways that they And so uh, the first visit I, I ever made to Rwanda, I was just getting introduced to these ideas. And the first visit I ever made to Rwanda, uh, Dr. George uh, Takiruta was, er, was the head of surgery, and he gave this presentation. And what you'll see on that screen is non-technical skills for surgeons. And I said, get out of here. I come all the way to Kigali, and I'm going to like finally get taught non-technical skills for surgeons. And uh, Dr. George had been exposed to the curriculum in Scotland and was talking through these important skills for high performance in surgery. So the question came, well, what about Rwanda? What about non-technical skills? If I'm operating in Rwanda or she's operating in Rwanda, um, what's different? Uh, what's different about the context? You know, you see the operating room there. It's, it's a little different than the other operating room we saw. But actually, sometimes it's a lot different than the other operating room we saw because there's a lot of different variables that you have to uh, hold into consideration. And so the question is, how does context influence uh, high performance in surgery? 
And if you don't want to wait for new technology, you don't want to invest a whole lot of money in some new machine or some new robot or something like that, what if we just had our surgeons better at their non-technical skills? And, and so how does context influence the skills you need and how they're applied? And the answer is context influences it across the board, everywhere. Uh, whether that's how your patients are a little different, um, the technical skills you need may be similar, but the cognitive skills you need are gonna be a little different. Um, the, the likelihood of error is gonna be different depending where you are and, and what it means to have good outcomes is gonna change. So that was the challenge that we were proposed with, is trying to understand how can we develop a curriculum to teach non-technical skills in a context very different from where the first uh, curriculum was developed. So this story is really a story of relationships. And this is like my favorite slide because these are all like dear friends uh, that were a lot of fun to work with. Um, but this is Dr. George, uh, who is head of surgery in Rwanda, you saw in the prior slide. Uh, Robert Riviello is a, a surgeon at the Brigham who worked with the Human Resource for Health and uh, helped with the training program there in Rwanda. Uh, you see here, uh, Dr. Abahuje, who is looking good and dapper and winning an award uh, in this photo, uh, with Steve Yule, who is the author of the first Knotts curriculum from way back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and has gone on to be a mentor. And then uh, you see me with a bad haircut uh, and pleated pants, and this is my uh, dear colleague, Zeta Mutabazi, and I'm going to tell you about the uh, uh, way we developed this program, and I couldn't have done it without my partnership with Zeta. Um, and so throughout this, there are partnerships, and there, there's parallels of folks developing each other, iron sharpening iron, skills uh, coming together, knowledge that you can't have alone. Uh, you know, there's an old proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and it's really been fun uh, to learn and to grow uh, with, uh, with each other and do it together. So we set out to develop a novel curriculum for non-technical skills for surgeons in Rwanda. And we had this handbook from Knotts, and then we had to figure out where to go from there. And so I'm just going to kind of walk you through that experience. Uh, and again, this is more from a research standpoint, if you're going to be a research resident in global surgery, because that's that was my role during my research time. It was my ADT time. I wasn't there to be a surgeon. Uh, I, I did some cases as a resident, just like I would in the U.S., moonlighting uh, as a resident uh, from time to time, but it was during my clinical or during my research time. And so uh, I went through the normal steps that you would go through to try to develop something. So the first thing we did was a literature review to try to understand what do we know about non-technical skills in low and middle income countries, period. And then we did lots of data collection. I'll tell you about that, what we learned, but we interviewed uh, almost every surgeon in Rwanda uh, at the time. Now there's a lot more surgeons. Um, we did, that says greater than 50, is about 90 hours of observations of the operating theaters in Rwanda to find out what are the skills that you need to, to, to succeed in that environment. Um, we then did some very fancy qualitative analytics that are just what we would do uh, with any research project anywhere we are. And we took our data and we fed them back to folks operating in Rwanda who are real experts of the context and experts of the domain to tell us is this real? Did we, did we make this stuff up? Did we get it right? Uh, is this actually helping? And from there, uh, we developed uh, uh, the first non-technical skills curriculum specifically for a variable resource context. And I'll tell you about what that means. Uh, we went on to build a set of videos. Uh, so there's a video library and a, a video curriculum that goes with the written curriculum now. Uh, I hope it's still being put to good use. Uh, Ajit, not in there. And then where I end my involvement, I wasn't even there. So my involvement ends like here. Uh, but the first ever uh, Knotts course that was context tailored was in uh, 2016. Uh, we had 55 residents there. And so because many of you are going to be going in the research lab and you say, gosh, I want to do global surgery, but like I have to have academic output and I'm supposed to just crank on a database, right? And like write a lot of papers. How do I, how do, I do all this? And my answer is I want, I want you to realize that through the mentorship that I got and that the team we put together, this is a very scientific approach. This is what we would do everywhere. This is state of the science of how you try to understand this. So we started with a lit review. Uh, we did a systematic review of at that point, the last 10 years. Uh, we found 
uh, about a dozen and a half studies. And it turns out the non-technical skills that were mentioned were about the same ones that we knew surgeons need. Um, but there was, we sort of learned about some of the contextual issues that um, the system was overburdened. And specifically, there were no teaching tools or education tools identified anywhere for here's how to teach these skills in this environment. So we knew we were entering a space where there just wasn't a lot of prior work work, but you got to do your work. You got to know what has been done before you. You have to know the landscape of what's out there uh, so that you're not, so that you can build off what's there and you're not just sort of re recreating it. Um, and then I mentioned the interviews we did. So we did 35, uh, 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 34 interviews. We did 90 hours of observation. So after we did our literature review, um, we used the same methods that were used in Scotland. And this is this critical incident technique. It's these observed observations. I can go into all these sort of detailed, in-depth, qualitative methodologies, but that's not really the point of this talk. Um, but we did exactly the same way that they developed it in Scotland um, the first time around. And then we did our coding line by line of all the transcripts. And the first thing we tried to do was understand what makes the context different? What makes the context, you know, uh, a challenge and what are the themes that keep coming up and what we found was it's about variability um, and so it's not a low, low reason uh, it's a variable resource setting one day they're doing nasal fiber optic intubations or they're doing cardiac surgery and then another day there's no linens and so you can't start the OR and, until they're linens and, and fixed scarcity is a lot easier to navigate than variable uh, resources because you have to have multiple ways to react and the surgeons who were operating who weren't from the US or who weren't from Rwanda were terrible at this. They would just like shut down and collapse and say, I don't know what to do, I don't have the thing. Whereas the uh, surgeons who were used to the environment, trained there, just navigate right through and say, okay, this is a problem, so now let's do this, now let's do this. And we said, wow, these are the skills that you're gonna need to be in this environment. And so we identified sort of uh, resource variability, staffing variability, communication and systems. Um, and with that, we then wanted to look at the actual skills required to navigate that variability. And it turns out it was the same set of uh, behaviors. I'm gonna speed through this a little bit. It was the same set of behaviors, situation awareness, decision-making, communication, teamwork, leadership. And the way that each of these behaviors addresses a different type of variability was a little bit different. And so understanding the variability and resources uh, really leaned a lot on uh, your decision-making skills. Uh, but understanding variability in communications, language, and staff uh, really uh, made you flex your teamworking skills and your communication skills. And so we were able to map both those out. These are both published in Annals of Surgery. And so they're not meant to be, this is how it is in Rwanda. It's, this is a method to go into an environment that these ideas have not been you know, uh, written about in this way before. And here's like sort of standard uh, state of the science methodology to understand this. So you can apply this to any environment. So then we wanted to know, did we get it right? And we did some participant feedback sessions. Um, and bottom line, a lot of green bars, little red bars. So the point is uh, the participants in the feedback session said, yeah, this framework kind of makes sense. And the variability elements that you're talking about sort of makes sense. But the other take home was uh, we would love to like teach this here. Uh, we would love to integrate it in the curriculum of training our residents here in Rwanda. But like those videos that you have from Scotland are like kind of terrible. Like they don't really teach, whatever you're trying to teach, I don't get it. Cause you're talking about stuff that doesn't make sense. Those are not our patients. Those are not our procedures. Those are not our issues. And so uh, it's a cool idea but the curriculum that exists right now is not really speaking to our experience. If you want us to be expert in, in our context, then you need to you know, maybe find a little better way. And so that's where we move on to the curriculum development. Now, one of the take homes you heard is teamwork makes a dream work. Uh, uh, Yihan Lin took over after me and she really led the development of, uh, of the curriculum building. And actually this chin right here is uh, Dr. Abahuje. Uh, Chen got edited out. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, then there were other residents and other students that just took this work and grew, 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 grew. And so beyond this point, I was back clinical. I had to go back to my, uh, my residency job. And I said, you know, gosh, this is just getting started. It's just getting fun. We're just turning this into a real thing. 
Um, but that was my that was my contribution to make and my role to have. Uh, and then uh, some other teammates uh, helped really push it forward. And so in 2017, we made the first uh, full curriculum. Uh, Ajit will be able to tell us if we have version two yet, um, but this one is, uh, is pretty good. Um, and it outlines the behaviors and, and how to rate uh, people's skills and how to teach them and how to improve them. And, and uh, it's just like the same one that was developed in Scotland, um, but this one is based on primary data, primary literature, best methodology to try to understand these challenges. Uh, and then finally, uh, I did get to go back for what was a ton of fun. The Kwetu Film Institute here is in Kigali, and these are super bright, super creative uh, film students. And we came to them and we said, see these videos that are really kind of crummy and don't tell the story we're trying to tell. Can you help us build videos uh, and film videos that tell the story to be a part of this curriculum? And so now there are multiple teaching videos uh, that are all a part of the Rwandan curriculum. And uh, it was a ton of fun. So this is the, um, a lot of the, the film students here uh, and a couple of the actors. Uh, and that's yeah, Yihan here. And I, I made it back to Rwanda for this one because it was too much fun that I, I think I was on my spring break or something, but made a, made a quick trip back. But we set up a bunch of different camera angles and I mean it was just it was so cool to see it really come to life. Um, I think I have a snippet of one of the videos here. Uh, let's see if the audio works on Zoom. Can y'all hear that? Yeah we can hear it. Okay so, so each of these has a teaching note and goes through uh, uh, like a scenario and, and you're meant to observe the skills and see are they good skills are they poor skills are they good behaviors poor behaviors how can you make them better we need to park, okay lift that you see okay there is a bleeding there over the the lever so give me the both here. I want to see if I can <laughs> just spot this bleeding. So that is, uh, we, we could dissect that later. Not a lot of good communication happening there. I uh, got some folks, folks speaking French, some speaking English, not, not speaking, uh, and it, it goes on and on and on. And, and there's some um, fun uh, videos there. But that was so cool that the film students from the Kwetu Film Institute like made those, it's just incredible, very inspiring, very creative, uh, awesome graphic design. And then finally, uh, I missed the first Knots Masterclass, uh, but as you can tell us a lot more about the first and the many more beyond that. Um, but there were 55 students uh, in the class uh, and uh, there's uh, Ajid uh, looking, looking dapper uh, as always. And um, it was the first time that the context specific curriculum had been taught um, and yet we used that opportunity to get feedback. And, and so we said, well, like, tell us, did it work? Like, what, what do you think? And then we, we assess the feedback and we, we use a qualitative methodology to understand how can we make it better? How, what can we do different? And the, the answers were, you know, include more than just surgeons. And the answers were like, we should do this more often. And uh, we were happy to see that people thought the videos were realistic and, and well-suited. And so um, I'm done. Uh, yammering about that. Again, this goes back to those take-homes. I hope what you've seen through this is this was a big team of a lot of people. Um, it was, you know, qualitative methods, state of the science, uh, really ad addressing as we go, trying to get feedback throughout the whole time, but it took a huge team to do it. Um, and we didn't make it different because it was Rwanda. We did the, the same thing we would do in the U.S. We did the same thing we would do here at Michigan. Uh, is, is we use the best metho methodologies that we could uh, to try to understand how to make this work better. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, really it was these partnerships that uh, made it um, a success up to that point. And that would be pretty cool. We got some papers out of it. We had like so Kumbaya session and people gave us like, you know, four stars on Yelp and, and everybody was happy. And you could just fold your hands and say, you know, I had a good time. I did a thing. Isn't that great? but that's not where the story ends because if this story ended there, it would be actually a pretty sad story. Uh, and so now I'm gonna be quiet and let Dr. Uh, Abahuja take over.
I think you're mute, Dr. Abahuje. Oh, thanks. Let me start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. So uh, thank you uh, very much, John, because uh, what you did was the foundation of this work, and you did it well so that we who followed you have been pleased to work into your uh, footstep. Um, so I'm going to discuss about uh, non-technical skill from where John left and what we did and what we plan to do for the future. So I will focus on the green box below about how this curriculum on non-technical skills for variable resource context has been delivered in Rwanda and how we plan to move forward. So after getting the curriculum specific to the Rwandan context, it has been taught to a trainees from the University of Rwanda. This was in 2018, where we had 120 participants from different uh, specialties from surgery, anesthesia, obstetric and gynecology and ENT and staff from the hospital, including perioperative nurses and non-physician anesthetists who come to this course and enjoy this course. So after giving this course, after the first session of this course, the anesthetist complained saying, there's no way you can teach these important skills to surgeons, yet they work with anesthetists and the perioperative nurse. If you don't include us, they will not succeed. So we started including inviting non-surgeon to these courses. So based on this feedback, we thought that as 80% of the people, I mean, 8% of the surgeon, the surgical procedures in Rwanda are conducted in district hospitals by non-surgeon physician, like general practitioners who complete their medical school, who are still waiting to go to residency. Those are the surgeons in Rwandan district hospitals, and they do more than 80% of the procedures. And they are got help by non-physician anesthetists and perioperative nurses with some post-core, post-high school training, ranging from two years to four years. The plan was to teach non-technical skills in all district hospitals. And there was another training program that was run by the Rwanda Surgical Society that was teaching essential surgical skills. This is called LES, Rwanda Essential Surgical Training. So we wanted to integrate non-technical skills to essential surgery training program in the district hospitals so that we can reach the maximum and, and get more impact. So this study was, I mean, this project was funded by the Royal College of Surgeon of Edinburgh and g and &G. So this is also shows the group good partnership between uh, institution from developing developed countries and developing countries. So this study was implemented in collaboration between the RCSD, Rwanda Surgical Society, and Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. And initially, we conducted the training for the instructors. These were the are the surgeon, the non-physician anesthetist, and the perioperative nurses from uh, University Teaching Hospital in Rwanda who were part of the Rwanda Essential Surgery Training Instructors. So we invited them, trained them on non-technical skills for a day. The following day, they delivered non-technical skills course to trainees from the University of Rwanda. This was in 2019. And then a month later, they started teaching non-technical skills in district hospitals. So in district hospitals, we conducted a two days training uh, the first day was focusing on non-technical skills where the trainees uh, reviewed like they uh, were taught about non-technical skills through short lectures, watching simulation-based video that uh, John produced, and also followed by small group discussions. And on the second day, they spent most of the day in the operating room, learning how to operate, learning the technical skills, but as they were, they were, they would, they could not all scrub into the cases. Their peers used the non-technical skills rating tool to assess their, their colleagues. And then at the end of the operation, they used to sit, discuss, and uh, assess how they can improve their non-technical skills. 
after the training, we we did the monitoring and evaluation through weekly WhatsApp group discussion. So after the training, we created WhatsApp groups that included all the trainers and trainees. And each week we used to send a case for discussion on non-technical skills. And then immediately after the course, we had like the post-course survey that the participants completed. And this allowed us to get the feedback on the reaction and the perception about the non-technical skills, but also how they implemented the non-technical skills. So two months to three, to three months, we made a follow-up visit to some of the hospitals to assess how participants implement non-technical skills. We conducted qualitative, qualitative data collection like interviews, focus groups, and also direct observation in the operating room to see how they implement non-technical skills and then give them feedback. And this was a team-based training. We had the general practitioners, the anesthetists, the perioperative nurses. Some of the feedback we got from trainees is that they think that this course was relevant, the video were relevant, and also the instructors were skilled. Uh, they had, they, 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 they know the context, they know the challenges in district hospitals and Rwandan surgical care, and then they will help trainees to navigate through those contexts. However, one of the challenges they identified was that if they work with people who didn't take the course, it was difficult for them to implement non-technical skills. Uh, and they recommend to train more people, they work together from their hospitals. So as a result of this training, we trained uh, 68 people from 17 hospitals and we had anesthetists, nurses, and general practitioners from those hospitals. So what we learned from this uh, program is that the context matters, as uh, John said. We couldn't teach this course using the scenario that were filmed from the US or the UK. The Rwandan, video, the Rwandan videos were much relevant and they were engaging uh, participants. And it is important to train teams because, as you know, the surgeon or the doctors and the nurses and the anesthetists, they go through different schools and yet they have to work together. If you want to train them to improve their performance skills, it's better to train them as a team. And also empowerment. One of the challenges they mentioned is that the power differences. A nurse in the district hospitals or an anesthetist is not... Um, empowered to speak up when he sees like a doctor is about to make a mistake or to ask him any question related to the patient but if they work with someone who took the course they were they feel empowered to speak up and optimize patient safety the human factors are also important it's important to understand how the human the institution and the system interact to, to improve their safety culture so future directions, so we got the ask from the College of Surgeon of Central East and Southern Africa. This is a, a training and credentialing college for 12 countries or 13 countries in Africa. They train surgeons in different specialties. They want to integrate non-technical skills in their training program. So we are working with them to see how we can make this happen. There are also the Pan-African Pan -African Academy for Christian Surgeon. They also have their training programs and they want their, their trainees to go through, to get the nurse training. We had to teach them like in March or April this year, unfortunately due to COVID, we were not able to, to, to teach, to train them. There's also the West African College of Surgeon. They are also interested in uh, this non-technical skills course. We made some workshop during the West African College of Surgeon uh, conference, and it was an interesting. Uh, it was interesting to hear from them that they think that these skills are needed to improve their, the safety of their patients. And so we are thinking about how we can teach non-technical skills, but also integrating non-technical skills to technical skills. But also, we also think uh, about the good strategies of help tra helping trainees to 
implement non-technical skills about uh, combining it with some quality improvement project or initiative at the hospital so that they can be able to implement and assess their performance and the impact of non-technical skills on the patient outcome. So we need to adapt these non-technical skills because not only the context, but also the teams or the participants. So the future steps, as John asked about version two, we are still working on that, but the second version of the notes uh, handbook will be for multidisciplinary teams. So we will include the anesthetist and nurses perspective. The video will be more uh, inclusive, like the initial one we are focusing on surgeon. We want to make a video for multidisciplinary teams. And also to uh, optimize uh, the time we spend with participants, we, we are thinking about making the course uh, branded, like taking some part online and some part in face-to-face, -face, focusing much of the theory and the, much of the theory online and the time we spend together in classroom be to discuss about how they can implement the non-technical skills. Think about the quality improvement project and how we can uh, help them implement those uh, quality improvement projects. And also do post-course follow-up uh, either monthly or weekly to assess how they implemented the non-technical skills. So what, what I think about this, uh, my reflection about this program is that um, this has been successful due to a strong partnership between uh, uh, a strong people, strong leaders, strong academician. And if you want to make a, sustain, a successful partnership, we have to focus on sustainability. So initially, you have to solve a lot of problems. So if you go, if you want to participate in uh, global surgery, you should understand the local context and the local problem they have and help them solve those problems. Ajit, yes. can you click on that slide, number 14, because I think it's not showing up full screen, at least on my screen. Is it, so, is it, is it too good not to see? Do you see it? I do not. Oh. Do others? I see the very first slide. You don't see this slide. I just see slide 11, knots, rest, impact. Same. There you go. There we go. Okay. So if you want to build strong global health or global surgery partnership, you should focus on uh, sustainability. So sustainability starts with solving local and real problems, not your problems. Sometimes people go with their own problems that they want to, to, to solve and they forget the people they work with. So discuss with partners, identify and understand their problems and then get solution to those problems. You have also to involve the leaders because as John has said, Dr. George, who was the former chair of surgery at my university, he was a strong leader who knew what was needed and then influenced other people to buy in and get involved in that uh, partnership. So we had a strong leaders from both sides, from Rwanda, from US and from UK, who were leading this uh, partnership. We have to involve uh, local leaders or local partners in planning, implementation and evaluation. So during this, the literature review, during the, uh, the systematic review and also the qualitative research that uh, John led, all the local partners like Dr. George, uh, Zeta, were part of the team and even during the publication. Sometimes the local partners contribute in implementation, but when it is about evaluation and publication, they got left behind. That is not fair if you want to build a strong uh, global surgery partnership. You should focus on what is done after you've left, not, not is done while you are here or what you do while you are there. So you should focus on capacity building because if uh, that was not the case, the program would end with John. But after him, there were other fellows who kept coming and then I got the opportunity to contribute. And I think that after me, there will be other people who will keep 
are this partnership going? You should focus on quality, not quantity. Sometimes people think that they count numbers to demonstrate what they've done or they achieved. But when you see really what the work they did, you find that there's nothing that contributes to the well-being of our local people. And you should focus on patients, not healthcare providers. Sometimes we, it's more likely in clinical care where we treat our problems, not the problems of the patient. Sometimes we provide care and leave patients with major problems that they had before getting care. So you should think about the patient and not the, the healthcare providers. So focus on the agenda of the patient, not agenda of the healthcare providers. So we should provide equity. Equity is in relation to context assessment because you should provide each institution or everyone what he needs to perform well. Not everyone, not every institution needs the same thing. You should understand this context to provide what the institution and the people needs to optimize to, to perform well. And you should always be ethical, either clinically or scientifically, be ethical. Don't do what you are not credentialed to do at home institution. And in the case you are in dilemma or you are in challenging solution, consult your peers, your local partners. They know how to navigate through this, the system and they can help you find the solution. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions and answers. Time for questions. Dr. Scott, Thanks. Dr. Abouji, that was so great. Um, any questions, guys? We have about 10 minutes. I have a quick question for both of you. Um, so, so you both talked that like, you know, you need to have that balance between between like having this this motivation, you know, to, to, to make this difference in, in global surgery, and then uh, also being able to communicate with with the with the locals so that you so that whatever you do is is useful and sustainable, right? The partnership. So so like, do you have any advice about 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 like creating this balance? You know, because some people just just leave, you know, because they want to make a difference, but then when they get there, maybe they don't have the resources to do that. So like like, what does it take to kind of find that balance between developing the partnerships and then, you know, having the, the, the idea or the desire to, to make a difference. Do you want to go first, John? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so I think, I, honestly, if you just screenshot Ajit's take home points, like that's the whole, that's the whole hour. Um, I think understanding like what, what goal are you trying to achieve? You say like, I have a passion for global health. And maybe what you're getting at is, I realize that like on this earth, there are places where people have like access to high quality care and there are other places where people don't have as ready access to high quality care. And I wanna be about solving that problem. And if your solution to that problem is to go and be one more surgeon operating, then you'll help some number of folks. And, and you just need to know that that's the, degree of impact that you can have because you can do however many cases and however much time you have and and whatever but if if your goal is really to transform the way care is delivered in whatever environment you're going to work in and again i i keep the same mindset whether i'm here in ann arbor or i'm in kigali it's what am i really trying to achieve and the difference is finding out what the priorities are where you're going now this was a really robust, like methodologically very savvy project. I mean, the, the papers that came out of this got published in like medical education, which is like one of the top medical education journals, like multiple things in annals. And it's not because we're good writers. I'm not a very good writer, but the, the methods were like the best that can be done. And it's because Rwanda in Kigali, that training program is really mature. Um, they have a great training program. They have really bright uh, people who are working to um, try to foster a research uh, engagement. Well, there are other places you may go where that's not the case at all. And no one has time. They're so busy. No one has time for research. And if you say, oh, we're going to take an extra year to go do it well, the methods say we should do it this way, then, you, then you're missing the point. And so the reason that was the right approach in Rwanda is because it was the right approach for Rwanda. 
But there might be other places where the right approach is just relationship building and go and learn and listen um, and realize this is a long arc. Like I came back to the, to the U.S. and I moved to Ann Arbor to learn how to be a great, great, great health services researcher because I found the problems that I was going to face in a place like Rwanda are going to be data problems. They're going to be systems problems. They're going to be implementation problems. And I want to be an expert at those skills. And so that's what I'm here to develop now. So keep in mind, the short term, you can get small results in the short term. You can get big results in the long term. You got to ask yourself what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, thanks. I think John said it well. You need to understand the priorities of the, your partners and see how you can contribute to those priorities. And understanding that you cannot solve all problems, but you can contribute to, so to the solution. And from there, other people can take over and uh, move towards your goal or the goal you share with your partners. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what experience um, both of you had in surgical education or medical education prior to taking this project on and like how that informed um, what you did. And, you know, maybe if this was a new area for you, um, you know, how you, how you tackled informing yourself so that you could um, do the best possible job to make an impact. Thank you. I think in terms of surgical education, like before, when John and Steve Ewell came to Seashka, I mean, at our hospital, to talk about non-technical skills, I didn't have, I didn't know what it was, and I got to know it after getting to it like the second time, and I think maybe these are the skills we need that we don't learn, that we don't teach. And before I didn't plan to get a career in non-technical skills or uh, simulation and so on. But after getting exposure to the, to the non-technical skills, I found that we, we need more, we need non-technical skills as we need technical skills. And we don't have expertise in teaching non-technical skills. So I said maybe, let me take this career and see how I can contribute to improving patient safety through non-technical skills education. And another thing is that uh, through this partnership, there is uh, a bilateral benefits. As, non as John came to Rwanda, spent two years in Rwanda working on non-technical skills, I got the opportunity to come to the U.S., do more research on non-technical skills, than simulation that we have, don't have in Rwanda and so on. And this was a mutual benefit in both not only as individual, but also as programs. Yeah, I think you ask, like, it's such a great question because it, yeah, I sound like um, I'm on repeat over and over. If you're in your academic development time, you're in your research time, uh, you know, Val's just getting started, uh, at least she's getting started. So do you, like, have expertise in health services research or implementation science? No, you get great mentorship. And like, I didn't know how to do qualitative methods, but I knew I was gonna do this project. And I had a great mentor in Steve Yule, and he said, go get the skills you need to do this before you get there. And so I, was, I got an MPH the year prior to moving to Rwanda. And I took all the qualitative methods classes I could. I piloted the methods as my homework for my MPH classes. I did observations and interviews of US surgeons just to like hone the techniques and get better at the skills so that when I was doing it in Rwanda, I like had expert feedback from my professors and from Steve and from my mentors uh, so that when I got to do the work, I, I was acting as a research resident doing what a research resident would. Now it would have been totally foolish of me to be the entire leader of the, you know, research enterprise because I didn't have the skills or the knowledge to do that, but Steve Yule did. And so um, just like anywhere, it's just getting the, 
making sure you have a team, making sure you have mentorship. And Steve came to Rhonda twice, maybe, um, but Steve wasn't there all the time. And so, you know, now with Zoom, it's even easier, but we would just talk through WhatsApp or we would communicate. And so if you're based out of the U.S. and want to go somewhere else and you're like, well, I don't have research mentorship there, find research mentorship where you're at. And then you can keep bringing those data back or you can bring your challenges back uh, and then continue to grow from there. And I, I really believe so strongly that whenever you're engaged anywhere in the world, you should be engaged at the level that you're at and that you need mentorship and you need mentees. And so I had students working with me when I was a resident and I had my profs that were teaching me and those were all on the U.S. side. And then I had parallels for each of those uh, on the Rwandan side. So don't wait till you have all the skills. Uh, it's fine to learn them in real time, but what's not fine is to like not try to do the homework ahead of time and then to try to take on a different role to say like, I'm going to be the director of qualitative research at University of Rwanda. Yeah, right. I was, I was a student. I was just learning. And, uh, and that, but that's why I was successful. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, when you're bringing in uh, new surgeons, new residents, do they go through like a cultural class or any sort of like a debriefing before they get to Africa? Um, this is a great question. I think different organizations handle this very differently. Um, even from the vocabulary that's used uh, to the role that you're going to play to understanding the context of where you're at and understanding the relationship dynamics. I mean, heck, if you just go to a different hospital in the U.S. that's a different hospital than the one you've been training at, people are like, well, that's not the way we do things around here. And so, you know, all the humility that you need to be new uh, exists everywhere. And it's just maybe a little bit different. Uh, on one way uh, or another, and you kind of learn along the way. Um, I was really lucky to have great mentorship. Uh, one of the surgeons on one of the earlier slides, a guy named Robert Riviello, and he um, was part of the education program there. And we didn't have like a specific pre-launch curriculum, but they may have something like that now. Um, I think that if you have some structure, that's great to learn some of the nuances and to learn who's who, but really it's just humility. You just come in with humility. It's like good advice everywhere in the world, including wherever you are right now. Um, but lead with humility because uh, you're, as a visitor, you're often given privilege as a visitor. Like, oh, you're the visitor. Here, come sit up front. And that's really nice. Uh, but then you have to like kind of look around and, and be aware of like, I'm the only person my age sitting up front everybody else are the big bosses. So maybe they're just trying to be nice to me and I should kind of like work myself back. And, and that's something you learn over time. So um, a rambly answer to say, I didn't have a specific curriculum, but I had a network of people who could teach me a lot. Um, and if you do, that's great. But if you don't, humility, humility, humility. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? I have to push them over the edge. This is our like 10 session, so this method works really well. Um, in terms of the uh, non-surgical skills, do you feel that there's one that, you know, us as rising surgeons, maybe is the possible surgeons, <laughs> um, is there one that maybe we should try, like, do you believe that there's one that's really underlooked or that it's pretty important and maybe lacks nowadays? Ajit, what's the most important non-technical skill, Ajit? Uh, so I wouldn't say that there was, there is a most important non-technical skills on my side, but uh, based on the interaction I had with the participants who took the course through the interviews and the focus group. When you discuss with them about the non-technical skills and how they apply them and so on, the thing that comes up 
media which is communication and teamwork. So I think I don't know if that is the skills that they don't apply or they think is most important, or if it is the if those are the skills that they um, they still remember or, or about among all, all the skills they took from they learned from the non-technical skills. But I think most of the topics that comes in when we want to discuss about non-technical skills are communication and teamwork. So but also I think other skills are important depending on the context. Sometimes uh, in effective leadership or in effective decision making might lead to a, a serious medical error that cannot be prevented by uh, communication, effective communication and teamwork. Yeah, and, and the data support exactly what Ajay just said. Um, communication, when we look at errors, it's almost always uh, errors in communication. And it's both in uh, what is said, what is heard, and the biggest problem is when I, I think I communicated something but the person I communicated to didn't get what I put out there, right? That, I mean, of course, that's how communication works. But um, if you take a knots class, you can learn all these little tips and tricks about ways to be a better communicator in the OR. And I know that seems like very non-exciting. Like, you know, I want to learn how to like sew on the aorta. But it, it turns out like good communication skills are probably related to a lot more errors than uh, where you put your needle. Um, and so if you really want to function at a high level uh, consistently, um, in good communication, when it happens, you don't notice it. Like that, that's what's great about non-technical skills. When you've operated with surgeons and you're like, man, she's just so good. Like everything's just easy for her. It just like happens. Like that's somebody who has really good non-technical skills. Uh, and it's because we don't talk about it much. This might be the first time you've ever heard of it. Uh, and yet there's a curriculum that's been out there for 15 years or so. Um, but uh, when, it, when it works really well, you don't even notice it. But if you can learn how to categorize it through, you know, the course uh, or course like it, then uh, you can really, you know, improve your own uh, game. Because ultimately the goal is better patient outcomes, right? The goal is not to like sit around and have another Zoom chat and feel good about ourselves. The, the goal is that patients do better. Um, and that we know surgeons with good non-technical skills have better outcomes. So you can be one of those two. Thank you. Uh, when you were talking about, you know, operating with someone who like it appeared that everything was easy. I was like, how does she do it? I was like, that's like me asking every time I'm operating with Dr. Kowache, like, how does she do it? Even when things get really hard. So like that translates, like sometimes it's hard to translate some of these things in like the context that you're on. Uh, but it like, it, there is definitely like after being introduced to kind of like this con like this, this framework and then like paying like two seconds more of attention to some of my attendings and actually senior residents trying to figure out like what's that like, what's in the secret sauce for like you making this like, you know, just taking care of patients both in the OR but also outside like so like, like just seamless um and i i can attest i can testify <laughs> that it does and it's a it's a it's a constant goal of mine to like apply some of these principles now that i'm like a little bit further down the road um and i i have one question uh so how do you see like uh knots being applied in like u.s uh uh training we who lack who have much but lack everything at the same time in terms of communicating, providing great care to patients? I think John can answer that question because I'm not familiar with the US clinical practice. So what was a ton of fun was while we were developing the Rwandan version of Knots, they were also in parallel developing the US version of it because it was it's very UK heavy for better or worse but like when I saw the original course developed from Scotland some of the language didn't make a ton of sense or some of the references that were like funny to everybody else in the room didn't make any sense to me and uh, it was very apparent that if it was going to be rolled out uh, in the US then it would need context adaptation and so it was really cool that we're like you know we're kind of leading the way in Rwanda the US is going to catch up eventually 
Uh, and so it does exist. There's actually an, a, an online version that I think is available through the ACS. Um, and I'll, I can try to find the link, but there is like modules like what Ajid was alluding to uh, with videos. I'm actually a terrible, terrible actor as an anesthesiologist in a couple of videos. <laughs> Uh, because when I was stateside, they're like, oh, you, you know about this. You should be an extra in the video. <laughs> so, it's like, great. Um, so it exists, but it's just not necessarily in every, there's score modules on it, but you know, it's not a focus. Uh, you have to have a local champion. I mean, it, it is blowing up in, in Rwanda because of Dr. George and because of Ajid and because of others who have really, really been strong leaders. 